Okay, here we go. Let's see how this goes. Welcome everybody. Uh, I'm here to talk about growing community with sprightly goblins. Um, and I'll explain what that means in just a moment. So let's get to my introduction. So my name, as you may have heard Christine say earlier, my name is David Thompson. Uh, I am the core infrastructure architect at the Sprightly Network Communities Institute. Um, I've been doing programming professionally for a little over 10 years now. Um, I just joined Sprightly back in December. And what I wanna share with you today is a high level about what, what Sprightly Goblins is, why you should care about it, why it's interesting, and then go through my experience as a beginner um, and building, you know, building a small demo my first week when I didn't really know much and uh, hopefully show you that you can also do this. Um, but first, a quick bit about the Sprightly Institute. We're a 501c3 nonprofit that's focused on re-decentralizing network communities. I don't think I have to explain to everyone here uh, about the problems with centralization. So I assume everyone is on board with re-decentralizing them. Um, quick bit about our founders. Uh, I think probably everyone here is already aware of Christine Lemmer Weber, uh, who has had a long uh, experience uh, with working in the free and open source software communities and with a particular focus on social networking. She's the co-author of the ActivityPub standard that Mastodon and other applications use. Uh, she started the Sprightly project, which is what grew into the Sprightly Foundation, or the Sprightly Institute, sorry. And um, you may also might remember GNU Media Goblin, uh, the, uh, an application that still is around today, but was started um, by Christine and was kind of the project that a lot of um, what Sprightly has become, uh, kind of the, originate, uh, the originating point for a lot of this stuff. Uh, and also uh, our other co-founder is Randy Farmer, who has over 40 years uh, working in this space, not only with social platforms, but with decentralized social platforms, um, in, including working on the basically the first ever MMO. Uh, he's worked for a company called Electric Communities. Um, he is uh, responsible for popularizing or helping popularize the notion of avatars as like a digital representation of oneself online. Um, worked with the language E and is also is involved in the JSON uh, standard. And yes, great. Find my, uh oh, there we go. I think I went one. Okay, my computer's a little bit slow. All right. So first, um, what is Goblins? Um, it's a cute name. What is it? Um, it's a library that makes building secure distributed applications easy. And we want to stress uh, how easy it is in this talk. So it has some important um, and really interesting qualities. The first of which is that it has um, the networking is peer to peer. And more importantly, uh, you don't have to think about it. There's an abstraction layer that takes care of network related things for you. Um, secure is the default. So, you know, um, building the, the future of decentralized and distributed uh, applications, social or otherwise, um, needs a strong, secure foundation. And Goblins gives that to you through something called object capability security, which we'll get into a little bit um, in a future slide. And it, all, it has a, a number of other interesting features, such as um, easy fail state handling uh, with transactions, um, such that you know if something goes wrong in your application, you're able to roll back to a known good state and carry on, and the state of your application isn't trashed and you're able to survive what might otherwise be you know, fatal errors. Um, there are more features, but I'll leave it at that for now. Um, here's a question, you know, why build new architecture? There's a lot of stuff out there. You know, do we really need goblins? You know, why can't we just keep building on ActivityPub and you know, think, things like that? And ActivityPub is great, um, but I wanna stress that goblins opens opens doors for new and secure decentralized social experiences. And they go, the use cases go beyond kind of follow only federated web applications like Mastodon. And we can expand things into more uh, immersive, featureful things like virtual worlds. You can think of um, games, 
um, as, a, as one particularly nice example with lots of social elements to them. So, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna introduce a few concepts here. Oh, and I just realized I'm gonna pay attention, I'm gonna try to pay attention to the chat if any people in the chat have questions. Um, hard to look at two monitors. Okay, so first, a few concepts that were definitely new to me when I started that I wanna explain. Um, the most important of which um, are actors. So in goblins, actors represent the behavior within the application. Actors are, are little little creatures that uh, can send and receive asynchronous messages. Um, they are composable, which means you can build complex behavior by combining lots of little simple actors. Actors can change their behavior over the lifetime of an application and state changes to them are transactional. Oh, did my screen just stop sharing? I can see you sharing at least. Okay, sorry about that. My, my big blue button um, uh, rendering changed. Okay, anyhow, um, state changes within an application are transactional and very importantly, actors may live on someone else's computer entirely. And let's see, a word about security. Um, I probably don't need to um, <laughs> explain this too much, this first bullet point, but you know, we're, we're starting from the basis that user-based access control with security is broken. Um, there's no reason why playing a game of solitaire that that application should be able to read my SSH public key, look at my pictures folder, those kinds of things. It should only have the access that it needs and no more, you know, writing to the screen, writing some graphics, maybe reading a file for the game specifically, um, and that's it. So instead in Goblins, actors provide the security model. And we have a little slogan um, that I've heard Christine say many, many times that I love, if you don't have it, you can't use it. And this is the basis of what we call object capability security. And if, um, oh, sorry, I was looking at the chat. And uh, if you wanna learn more in depth, things about object capability security today. I believe the session after this one in the same room, Christine is going to talk about that and I will be present as well. Okay, um, a little bit about networking. So you can talk to actors on other computers by using the object capabilities network, something we shorten to OCAPN. It's a network protocol and it takes care of um, all the network transport aspects so that you can focus on your application logic. Um, it can work over, um, you know, several different uh, network transports. Uh, right now, the one best supported by Goblins is Tor, but there could be other peer-to-peer um, -peer networking, uh, what we call a net layer that could be supported in the future. Um, very important uh, thing to stress is that talking to remote actors looks the same as talking to local ones. So when you're writing your program, whether the actor is on your machine or somewhere else, you write code the same way. And you don't have to worry about all the details of how does that message get you know, across the network to, to that other actor. It's, it's handled by the OCAPN uh, layer. Um, OCAPN is something that we are working on standardizing with some other organizations, and it's currently in a pre-standardization phase. So more to come on that subject in the future. Uh, a question some people may be wondering, um, I've wondered before, um, is Goblins essentially just an implementation of the OCAPN protocol? Well, it does contain the OCAPN protocol, but it's, it's more than that. Um, Goblins has um, killer features like transactionality. Uh, we're working on things like um, a distributed debugger, for example. Um, and those are features that Goblins adds on top of this network. So you won't get Goblin's killer features just using any other actor-based system. Okay, so that was a lot of conceptual high-level overview. Um, I think it would be fun to talk about games instead. I think they're a fun and engaging way to demonstrate new ideas. And during my first week with Sprightly, Christine tasked me with figuring out, you know, or she said, you know, you have two days, make me a demo that shows me that you understand, you know, at some basic level, what's going on here and how to work with actors and some basic object capability security. So um, I thought about what, what that might be. Um, I thought about my interests outside of computers. I like to garden. 
And Christine suggested, well, why don't you make a tile-based garden game where, diff where multiple people can you know, plant things in a garden? I thought that was great, so I decided to run with it. And I would like to share with you how I built it and the steps I went through and how Goblins made it you know, pretty easy to do. So my, my demo was modeled after a community garden. Uh, multiple users share a garden space represented by an eight by eight tile grid where the users or gardeners can plant and dig up tiles, but they must abide by community rules that state which kind of plants can be planted and um, which can't. Um, so, you know, you don't want someone just bringing in like some kind of mint that's going to crawl all over, you know, the, the whole garden and take over the whole patch. So there's, there's some rules about what you can bring in and not. So, like I said, that I made this in two days. And so there's a lot of limitations here. You know, I, I had a, I had the time pressure of only having a couple days to, to make something that, that looked okay and demonstrated what I need to demonstrate. And I didn't know how to program with goblins yet. So I kept things really simple. And I, that's why I think it's a good, this exercise is something good to show people that might want to just get into goblins for the first time. So before I move on, here's a screenshot of what it ended up looking like. Um, you know, I uh, used an interface with some, just some basic sprites and stuff like that. Um, and as I'll show that this is, you could barely call it a game, but it is a multiplayer game where multiple people can edit this little eight by eight grid. There's only two plants that are approved to plant here. Um, I found cute sprites for them. Uh, but, you know, nonetheless, it is something that works with multiple people. And yeah, I think it looks pretty okay for a couple of days. Okay. So when you make an application in Goblins, the most important thing to think about um, it are the actors that are involved. So before I worried about things like networking, representation, like visualization, just thought about what are the essential actors I need to make this system work. I came up with four. Um, there is a garden, which is that shared growing space, the eight by eight tile grid. There is a gardener, so the user, someone that can modify the garden, dig things up, plant them. Um, then there's this, uh, this plant expert I call the botanist, and uh, they're the one that can put the, the stamp of approval on a plant, to say that it can be grown in, some, in, uh, in a particular community garden. And then this one's slightly more conceptual, but I, I pictured the garden with, with a gate around it, and the botanist hangs out by that gate. And when you come into the garden with your plants, you have to check in with, at the garden gate and make sure that you know, what you're bringing in is allowed. Okay. So I'm going to sh show some code in, in the rest of these slides um, and a number of them, but it's uh, important to stress, you know, I, I don't imagine that everyone, one, knows what all these concepts mean, uh, two, uh, is familiar with scheme, uh, and three, it's just very hard to understand code um, in its entirety in a presentation. So I mostly want to get across that uh, these, these concepts that I've, that I've shown can actually be expressed quite succinctly in a very small amount of code. So um, in this case, the, uh, the botanist here, um, who I said is kind of in charge of approving plants for use in the garden, um, is represented by this code. And um, in Goblins, we use a little carrot to represent an uh, actor constructor. We think of it as a little, a little hard hat. They're doing the work of, of generating actors that can uh, be in our system. Um, and the botanist uses this special, uh, it's another kind of actor model thing that we call a sealer. And one, one way of describing a sealer is that it's essentially something that can put an unforgeable brand mark on an object. So the botanist can put a stamp on, like, let's say, I don't know, a packet of seeds that someone wants to plant and say, yep, I approve that. And you can bring it into the garden and no one can forge it. Um, uh, no, no, one, no one can take some other uh, seed packet and pretend that um, it's, it's approved. Um, so that's, that's what sealers do. Won't get too much into that, but very little code, um, and it's implementing um, part of our security model for this simple demo. Um, this next slide here is just showing how uh, we are spawning these actors that I've been talking about and to actually use them. So um, the first few lines are, you know, we create the, this botanist uh, fella and uh, fellow person, and we create the garden gate. Uh, and we give it a reference to the botanist because the botanist hangs out at the gate to watch for people bringing stuff in. Um, the garden uh, is consisted of a garden bed, as I mentioned, with an eight by eight tile grid, and uh, it's associated with that garden gate actor so that uh, it can check in and also know what's going on. 
make sure things are allowed. And then finally, we have the uh, plant approval process. You send a message to the botanist if you have access to the botanist, and you can get plants approved like the sunflower. And we also have gardeners. So in this case, we have a gardener named Alice who is associated with our garden. And on the last line, Alice plants a sunflower in tile 2.2. Two. So yep, not, not a lot of code to actually show this off. Um, so I showed you a screenshot earlier, um, but I didn't start there, you know, but making something graphical can be uh, complicated. So the next step was really text visualization. Um, so now that I've had actors and I've had, you know, things like telling Alice to plant in the garden, I needed to verify that, that it actually looked, looked right. So, you know, uh, a simple, simple text display within, within my scheme, uh, redeval print loop here, my console. Um, showed me that, you know, I made like a little smiley face weird thing there. And, you know, the C's are cabbages, the S's are sunflowers, and the dots are blank spaces. And look, great. Okay. There's an eight by eight grid. It, um, the stuff I expect to be there is there. So I can move on. And then I, I went on to do um, some graphical visualization. So things get more interesting here. Once the basics worked, I could render, I rendered text for the, um, for the garden had the interactions working, and then a graphical version, I split up the program into a host side and client side. And I used the Tor Onion service as the network transport layer. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Goblins currently works best over um, the Tor Onion uh, network. Um, more, more to come in the future, but if, you're, if you intend to use Goblins, that's really our best supported uh, net layer at the moment. And so, uh, to reiterate from earlier, messaging remote actors works just like messaging local ones. So I had already worked out the actors and their relationships previous to this. So when I added in networking, that code did not have to change. I just had to put in a little code um, to register actors on the network on, on the host side, and then on the client side, connect and pull in those um, uh, network registered actors. Um, this is also the first time I've ever made a multiplayer game, so I don't, like, I, I've tinkered with games in my free time, but I don't have, like, a strong background in this stuff, and yet I was able to do it with Goblins, so Goblins really enabled me to, to do something that before seemed kind of intimidating. Um, here's a screenshot um, of multiplayer in action. Um, on the left is the host. And there's like, in the, if you can read it in the bottom left, there's a little bit of an uh, log there showing what players are doing what. And on the right is the client side. So someone that has joined the garden. And uh, I can maybe, if there's time, try to give a live demo of this. Um, but for now, take my word for it that those are the representations of the same garden, one of, one of whom is a client to the other. OK. So more code, again, uh, just, to, just to show how few lines it takes to do this. Um, uh, in, in just a few lines of code, we're able to create what we call a net layer over the Tor Onion services, um, establish a new OCAPN uh, instance to handle uh, traffic over that net layer. And then finally, we register um, actors uh, with the OCAPN network. And that last line, the connect to thing, is we are just displaying a URI that we can use on the client side to import that actor so that we can message it over there. So this is the host program. And this is what the client side looks like. Again, just a, a, the, kind of the same few lines in reverse a little bit. We take in uh, a URI, something we call a sturdy ref. Don't worry about it, but that's what SREF means. Um, it's a special URI to identify the, act, the actor on the network. We do what we call enlivening, and that produces an actor that is uh, outside of this machine that we can then send messages to. Um, and so you see in the final line, we are registering a new gardener with the, with the community garden, and in this case, Alice. So Alice has moved from being a local actor in previous examples to a remote one. Um, so the one of the last things I did with this demo was, you know, for for kind of extrapolating a little bit, you know, most uh, networked applications need some amount of logging in order to like audit what's going on to have some sense of who's doing what is someone, you know, uh, abusing their privileges or whatever, you know, look for suspicious actions. 
So I added a simple audit log that explained this. Um, however, um, there is a big omission in this, in this demo. While it's audible, access to the garden is not revocable should someone abuse their privileges. Um, there's no way once someone's registered to kind of deregister them. If you gave them the URI to connect to your garden, that's, that's that. You can't really stop them at that point. So, um, but this was a limitation of time and not goblins. Um, uh, we have a paper, The Heart of Sprightly, that actually goes through implementing a blog uh, with revocable permission to pub publish to the blog. So um, just wanted to point that out in that uh, a future version of this demo could easily add uh, revocation capability. Um, so yeah, um, extrapolating from here, um, thinking about, you know, this conference is called Dec Decent Social, and I kind of just showed you a game where people can like edit tiles, like what does this have to do with that? Um, you know, a real community garden simulator could have lots of social elements. You could think about maybe a game that's kind of resembling am Animal Crossing. You could, you know, drop by someone's garden, leave a note, um, you know, like what someone did, you know, have some kind of uh, social, real social elements there. And, um, you know, people could visit or host many gardens and rules could differ between communities. So, um, you know, if someone really wanted to expand this idea, I think there's a you know, potential fun little little game here that could be th thought of as like a free software Animal Crossing style game uh, focused on community. Okay, uh, wrapping up. And again, I'm right about the 20 minute mark. So rest of the time is gonna be for discussion and questions. Um, so in summary, the goblins present concepts that are new to many of us and they were new to me as well. Although I've heard Christine talk a little bit about them before, um, you know, actors, sturdy refs, sealers, all, all, all these terms. But I want to stress that the basics can be learned quickly. Again, this demo was made in a short amount of time, you know, under some, uh, you know, real time pressure to kind of just like pick up the basics and, 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 and show that I can that I can do something in it. Um, and it really was not that hard to pick up and run with it and, and do something meaningful. meaningful. Um, you know, there's a, there's a few terms to learn, but then, you know, once you're past that, things kind of click and, and, and it's quite easy to model um, application logic with it. Um, Goblins is secure by default. Um, you, I showed you briefly in the code examples that, that um, you know, not just anyone can plant whatever they want in a garden. You know, we have, we have there was a, mes a mechanism to approve things that was not forgeable by, by bad actors. Um, so, Again, this is called object capability security, and you know this is the default uh, way of doing things in Goblins. So, um, you know, we are secure, you know, as at as a default. Um, and finally, Goblins handles networking for you, so you can really focus on your application logic. Um, really, like I don't, I don't think many of us, you know, I, I've worked in you know, decentralized applications, microservices, that kind of stuff, traditional HTTP APIs. Uh, debugging this stuff uh, isn't fun. Uh, dealing with networking, the network layers uh, really isn't fun. You know, HTTP keep alive, so other, you know, other, other issues, caching, all this stuff. Um, ha having that handled for you is a really big win and being able to just focus on high level ideas of what you want your application to do is like a, a huge, like productivity multiplier and, you know, uh, I, I don't think I wouldn't have been able to produce anything like this in the short amount of time I had without it. And yeah, so I want to just thank our supporters, uh, the Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized Web. Um, I believe their, their, their funding helped pay for me to be a full-time employee. So thank you. Uh, the NLNet Foundation is uh, providing uh, grant, grant funding, um, and it's helping with the OCAPN uh, implementation and standardization pro process. Um, MetaMask uh, recently became a supporter, and they're helping us uh, push forward the Guile on WASM project, which I won't get into here, but it's very cool if you're interested. And finally, Agoric, who's also in this space and has a lot of long time, um, long time uh, actor model and object capability uh, engineers in there. That's that we're working with on OCAPN standardization. So yeah, I think it's time for me to stop talking. Uh, thank you. Uh, check out these links if you want to learn more about Sprightly and Goblins. And the rest of this time is for, for you all.
uh, please ask me anything you'd like and or let's just have a discussion. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Christine. Um, but yeah, I'll take any any questions, comments, whatever. And, and while that's happening, I'm going to see if I can get uh, a live demo of this on my screen. I just didn't want to do that during my talk in case it do you want to uh, be even up. Do you want to be even bolder and have both of us do it together in a live demo? Because I just I just built the source of the latest code. Oh, uh, uh, you know what? I think I need to push something. But if you can do that and read Geek Shell for me, that would be that would be that would be cool. Cool. But I'm gonna I'm gonna stop my OBS recording here and get some CPU back. Uh, while Dave Dave you're muted or not audible otherwise. Yeah, my my bad. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna push something. So Daniel says, "What's happening behind the scene that creates a custom syntax you use for your application?" Uh, I'm not sure what a uh, custom syntax you mean. Actually, the, we've got uh, custom syntaxes in terms of Guile as a library. Uh, is that what you mean? Uh, basically, Guile is a library that sits on top of Scheme. Um, maybe maybe I can go back to a slide that might show what we're what they mean. Maybe like here. So actually here, there is, um, I'm trying to think, there is no new syntax introduced here. Um, the new terms that you might be looking at, uh, spawn, that's a regular scheme procedure. The dollar sign is a regular scheme procedure. And yeah, the things with carrots are just a convention for, for how we name uh, actor constructors. So, this is actually not using any scheme macros uh, at all. Um, we do have some, but the, they're not in these examples. Let's see. Uh, Christine, I did push an update to the um, geeks.scm uh, file, and I will attempt to create a garden now. Does it does it need the, the git version of Guile Goblins? I thought it could have just used the release version we just pushed out. It, it, it could use that version, but I just, um, it was uh, easier for me to just, I already had it, like pointed at Git. That, okay. That's all. all right. That's fine. That's fine. It's just a, it's, it's just out of like laziness. That's it. All right, cool. <laughs> but I, I reset it so that it'll be faster to build the Geek shell for me. All right. And clean. Bootstrap and configure. So and I'm going to give me an OCAP in your eye. Yep. Working on that. Let me DM it to you. All right. I hope that worked. So let's see. Let me get that window open. We got um, a question from Petra. Yes. Let me get to that now that I can focus. OK. <laughs> yeah, the URI is on the screen, Christine. Just type in all those fun letters and numbers. OK. Question, what's Goblin's approach to data? Is there a global state that's being coordinated or does each actor solely own its own state locally or would you describe it another way? Okay, so with regards to actors, um, actors live in things called VATs and I didn't, uh, that's V-A-T-S, VATs. I didn't want to um, bog down the, the presentation with describing them, but basically, uh, there's a place where actors live and there can be many such vats. They're kind of like, you think about it as like a big pool where all the actors are swimming around and stuff. And the state is managed in the vat. So the vat associates an actor with its current behavior. Um, so when an actor changes their state, um, it's registered uh, in, in inside the vat. I could get more detail. There's like, we could go down a whole rabbit hole of detail here, but um, there's no yeah. time. Oh, oh my gosh. I'm planting in your garden. Yeah. So everything you see on the screen is not me. That's Christine um, connecting and planting. And oh yeah, and you can see the log over there. Yep. And I'll just add. I'll add like this. Here we go. <laughs> Very cute. 
Um, Petra, did that answer your question? Because I, I think we, yeah, we I could think so. Draw, like, okay. I mean, it, it, in terms of that switch, I'll have to read about too, but yeah, it sounds cool. Okay, yeah, you can think of like an actor needs a home and like many, many such actors live in the same place. And uh, it's it's that place that's uh, keeping track of the state. But but yeah, your each actor is handling its own state as in terms of, um, and its state is just a procedure. It's how it responds to the next message. So you can use that. What you, what you also might be thinking is, well, what if you wanted to do coordination as in terms of, you know, you wanted to do CRDTs or something like that. You'd build CRDTs on top of the actors that you have or, you know, other other types of shared infrastructure, things like that. Um, so, yeah, the um, but but goblins itself does not provide the primitives to do uh, coordination in terms of coordinating data. It does provide a few things like it provides like there's a tiny set of libraries that it provides us in terms of like a pub sub protocol and some other things like that. But they're all really tiny. They're just very simple examples. In the future, we might have a more fleshed out toolkit for like, you know, here's a CRDT library you can import where in case you want to coordinate across a whole bunch of different uh, actors and stuff like that. Cool. That makes sense. Thanks. Thanks, Christine. Mm -hmm. Not to be inter not to be answering Dave's questions for him, you know, very rudely. Well, you are so good at answering them. So thank you. I, I went really high level and you gave uh, a more detailed picture. So I think that is very useful. I think, let's see, can I get, just for fun. Sometimes it takes a while to connect with Tor. Tor is not fast. But, yeah, but, so Christine already connected and, and edited, but maybe just for fun I can also have this. Let me get the log back up. Ah, there we go. Okay, Alice has joined, and so I don't. I don't forget. I don't have anything that says like who you are. Here we go. Sometimes things kind of blink in and out of existence as it sinks. But yep, there we go. So now, now there's three people uh, working on the garden. Uh, two of which are me. Oh, also, why tour? Uh, I think Christine could answer that best, why we chose that as the first one, it's first net layer. It's because it's uh, surprisingly easy. Tor provides two different, Tor really is two different things. People who are most familiar with the anonymizer network, but it also provides a peer-to-peer -peer, um, peer -peer network for like peer-to-peer -peer servers to connect to each other. That's really easy. It works uh, where it, it just works generally, except for when it doesn't. Um, you can, um, it's very easy to um, create new servers and it does all the hole punching and everything. It's not fast. It's not great if you want to do something real time like what we're trying to show off here. You can see the huge amount of lag. But it's also perfectly fine for if you're trying to bootstrap um, a peer to peer network. And you can use it for, like, if you're doing chat or other things like that, where, like, the, the, uh, um, it's really just that it has high latency, right? Um, then it, then, then you're, you're just putting up with that extra latency. But it, what's nice is that you're basically setting up, you just end up asking this, uh, there's this daemon that, that Tor runs and you just send it, hey, I want to create a new onion service. And it says, okay, I made it for you. Here's the key in case you want to reconnect to it again later in the future. Here's the address that other people can connect to it. And then it just gives you basically a socket. And then you can, from another machine, say, hey, I'd like to connect to this address. And it'll give you back another socket. And so you can just use socks to, and it's it's really, it's really just working with Unix sockets. So that made it very easy for us to bootstrap that side of things without having to solve all of the peer-to-peer -peer layer things. Like uh, we eventually plan on uh, connecting with libp2p and also having store and forward network so that you know people could like maybe use um, if you have a mobile phone that's going online and offline, maybe you want to uh, you know connect to some sort of HTTP based uh, thing where you're just dumping messages for somebody that are encrypted and then they pick them up when they're able to and stuff. But uh, the, that, the, so OCAP is specifically created so that the net, the network layers are abstracted. So that, um, so Tor, the Tor Onion service is just one net layer out of possibly many. 
Uh, in the future, we plan on supporting, you know, carrier t pigeons, you know, carrying micro SD card encrypted backpacks. So, you know, then we'll have cap T pigeon. So, you know, we'll, we're, we're, we're preparing for the apocalypse over here, but we're also preparing for faster yeah. transports than just tour. Yeah. And like death stranding style things, you know, chiral network. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Direct, direct neural links from person to person, you know, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, yeah. Um, well, uh, I, I know there's two minutes left before the break. Um, I can certainly be around a few minutes into the break um, before the next session. Uh, I just want to get up real quick and get some water before Christine leads the next thing in this room. Um, but any, any, just feel free to chime in with anything else you might want to talk about. Doesn't have to be a question. Um, I hope this was valuable to people that, that joined. Um, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm new uh, at Sprightly uh, and I thought a beginner's perspective would be useful to people wondering what the heck all this stuff is. I, I hope it was, um, but yeah, do, do let me know. Yeah, let me let me talk about Dave here. It was impressive just how I, I suggested Dave get this demo together. I did not expect that Dave was going to hook it up to a game engine so that it was graphical and stuff like that. Um, Dave got this thing. Dave said Dave took two days, but Dave really took one day because it was half of one day and half of another that this thing was put together in. So it was it was very fast that that you got this whole thing together. Yeah. Um, and and I think the whole garden thing from like a single line of code perspective. If you ignore the um, the just wiring up the network stuff, it's only like, I think, like 250 lines of code for this whole thing. And the core objects here, the botanist, the garden state, and the garden community are less than 90 lines of code. And that includes white space and the import definition. If you remove those, it's like 80 or, or maybe even 75. Yeah. Yeah. So, it, yeah, it's yeah. 70, 72 otherwise. So shocking. Most of this demo is handling like making it kind of look pretty with sprites. Like the core application logic in state is very small. Yeah, it's just 72 lines of code for this thing. Yeah. Pretty cool. And um, we also, you know, Goblins is like uh, all about like event driven loops and stuff like that and things running in threads and actors talking that way. Um, this game engine doesn't know anything about Goblins and we we're actually able to integrate the two so that they could. Um, you know, interoperate. So that's another interesting feature of goblins. If if uh, that I didn't want to highlight in the talk because I was trying to keep it high level, but um, you know, we also have things like we've been able to hook goblins up to uh, GTK application so that it, it plays nice with the GTK main loop, and we can make uh, you know traditional uh, graphical uh, like GUI applications that have goblins um, backed, you know, uh, state. And also, you saw here goblins on. Guile, and there are two, both Dave and I were using Guile processes, but we do have goblins on Racket as well, so two different language runtimes mm -hmm. are able to talk to each other, and programming in each of them looks like you're just programming against the local uh, language. And uh, there are more differences between Racket and Guile than you'd expect for two schemes, and uh, and yet, you know, That's you have true. more convenience. Um, so hey, I, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just breaking in here. Did you guys record the demo? I'd like to... Uh... I, re I recorded this whole session, and I think Dave tried okay, to yeah. locally too. So we've. Uh, yeah, I'll have to play it back and see if mine is any good. Also, yeah. Christine, I sent you an email earlier. I just want to make sure you got it. Uh, I'll I'll check Just that because. after this after I finish this uh, this right. video. Okay, Excellent. cool. Nice. All right. Um. Oh, okay. wait, Dave. I guess that's a wrap. Well, oh, wait, wait. One more thing before we hop off here, Dave. Can you say what your um, pro what what your current project is at the Sprightly Institute? What you're working on. Uh, the oh. T T T D D. What does that stand for? The other thing about time traveling one. distributed debugger. You got it. So yes, uh, debugging distributed applications is hard. We are trying to make tools to make it a lot easier, and using Goblin's transactionality to be able to do things like replay um, uh, events that may have led to a bug, so that you can um, debug them easier. I'm gonna I'm, I'm like gonna that. drop the the time travel thing just into this chat just so that people can see the time travel demo. If you click that link, you'll see um, a quick little demo of the Ask Garrett space cheater I made called Terminal Phase, and it um, and, and you can see moving backwards and forwards in time there. So if you take that same idea and you apply it to 
um, and you apply it to uh, a debugger, what that means is that you know if an error happens and you're like, well, what the heck was going on there? You can restore the state to that period inside of a little sandbox and debug against it. Um, and, and that's a kind of power that, that Goblins gives you. Yeah. So it's early days for this, a lot of research and stuff, but I think that's something uh, for all of you insiders here to look forward to in the future. I uh, am excited to hopefully be able to you know, share a lot more uh, about it in not too long. Um, may come in stages, but I think it, you know, each step of the way will be improving the, the debugging experience greatly. Yep. All right, I'm going to stop recording and let's go get uh, let's go get 